Let's pray uh, as we come before God's word. Heavenly Father, uh, you're awesome. Uh, you're doing something big in our city. Uh, you're at work here. Uh, um, you're beyond our comprehension. You're beyond our ability to understand. But you're active and alive. And you work in us. And you work through us. And so as we come to your word this morning, we pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what it is you want to say to your church. Would you give us soft hearts to be receptive and a desire and a willingness to change? So come, Holy Spirit, do your work here. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, I've uh, mentioned this before, but uh, when I was a kid, there was an embroidered poster of an owl hanging over my bed. Uh, my grandmother made it for me, I imagine, because she loved me, though. Uh, some of that got lost in translation. Uh, that embroidered owl was fairly terrifying to me as a child. Uh, you see, there were some words embroidered beside the owl. Uh, a prayer, probably one you know. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And every night I meditated on that prayer and my impending death. <laughs> and it seemed to me, the astute theologian that I was, that the secret of salvation itself lay trapped in this prayer. Otherwise, why would my grandmother have given it to me? Like these words were the ones that needed praying in order to make sure I was saved. Uh, and that might have been okay, except there was a blatant time clause in the prayer. If I should die before I wake. And that meant the prayer expired every single day. So I had to pray that every night. And not only that, it was a bit of a begging prayer. It's only two sentences and it says the same thing twice. I could figure that out as a 10-year-old. That obviously meant repetition was incredibly important. And so sometimes I prayed that prayer about a dozen times before I finally lay me down to sleep. Hoping beyond hope that somehow the rule had been followed, that God was satisfied and I would be saved. Good morning. Welcome to Fort George. Uh, you'll be happy to know my theology has developed a little bit from that day. Uh, you'll also perhaps be happy to know that you must be part of the elect because you guys have returned to church after a sermon on Romans chapter 9. Just give yourself a slap on the back there. You guys nailed it. I wasn't sure that was what was going to happen, but here we are. If you weren't here last week, uh, Romans 9 is all about uh, God's role in our salvation, uh, which is everything. Uh, he does it all. And so uh, Paul uses words like predestination, uh, election, to describe what God does. And God is like raising people up. He raised up a Pharaoh uh, to exert his will for his own purposes. So 100% of the salvation process is orchestrated by God. But now we're in chapter 10, which is the other side of the coin. It's about our role in salvation. So God's role in salvation is everything, and you've got a role. You ever done the math on that? Don't worry about it. In other words, what this means is when it comes to the question of predestination or free will, the answer is yes. We talked about that last week. It's not because God is contradictory. He's not contradictory. Rather, it's because the God who made us is bigger than we can possibly understand. Uh, imagine it a little bit like this. Imagine that you were a two-dimensional being, and you existed on a two-dimensional world. You'd have kind of a flat personality, right? And then imagine that all of a sudden, a three-dimensional object came into your two-dimensional world. Let's say it was a three-legged stool. And this stool passed through your frame of references, legs first. What would that be like? Well, all of a sudden, you would see three circles appear in your world. And you would swear that these were three individual things, right? And then 
all of a sudden they would be disconnected. That would be what would you what would you would be experiencing, and you would you would swear about that. But then all of a sudden, as the seat of the stool passed through your world, all of a sudden those three circles would become one larger circle. You would have no idea what had just happened, but. The problem with this would not be that there was a contradiction. The problem would simply be your own simplicity, right? Similarly, God's not contradictory. The one who made us is just bigger than we can get our heads around. So God can be both totally in control of the universe. He can be good. And at the same time, he can allow us to reject him and to suffer evil. All right, if you missed last week, you want a little bit more on the paradox of God, uh, or you just want to find out what happened to some bank robbers from our church, you can check that one out online. Uh, Incidentally, none of those bank robbers were in jail when I bumped into them this week. (laughs) That was a little bit awkward. And uh, all of them thought the story would have turned out differently than uh, I had told. Uh, However, it seems as long as I'm telling the stories, this is the flavor of reality that is going to, my characters are going to experience. So, uh, Preacher Boy strikes again. Anyway, (laughs) if you got a Bible, go ahead and open it up to Romans chapter 10. We're going to dig into our role in salvation. So God does it all. We have a role. Would you stand with me as we come before God's word? Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Hear now the word of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they didn't know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them, but the righteousness that's by Faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, it's in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess uh, profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. You can go ahead and be seated. So the context for Romans 10, just like for Romans 9, is this sad reality that Paul's brothers and sisters, the Jews, had mostly rejected Jesus. And this is what happens, even though they had received the covenants, uh, they had the law, uh, they had the temple, they had all God's promises and his prophets, uh, they had the stories of the patriarchs, they even had Jesus himself born from their line, and yet most of the Jews didn't trust in Jesus. And so in the first half of Romans chapter 10, Paul tells us two things. This is our outline today if you're taking notes. So first of all, he tells us what happened to the Jews. What happened to the Jews? Second, he tells us what's our role in salvation so that what happened to the Jews doesn't happen to us. That's where Paul is going. So first of all, what happened to the Jews? Look at verse 2. I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it's a misdirected zeal, for they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. The Jews didn't understand God. Now, as I was thinking about how to unpack this, I realized, actually, this is the exact point of a book called The Prodigal God by Tim Keller. 
It's actually a book that I'm reading with those uh, bank robbers and the other people in my life group. And uh, so if this is you, this is going to be a little bit familiar. We were talking about this last night. But uh, Keller does a, just a brilliant job of unpacking this story that Jesus tells in Luke 15 about two sons and a father. And it bears into this text. It's a story about how the Jews are misdirected in their search for God. But it also speaks to us because we can be misdirected as well. So the story of the prodigal son that Jesus told is different than we think. Very common story. It's different than we think. What, what we all know is that the father in this story is God. So there's a father in the story. The father is God. We all know that. What gets missed, though, is that there's two prodigals in the story, not one. And uh, we also miss that the two sons represent two different ways that people try to get God's stuff. So all of humanity wants to be happy. We all want health and wealth and love today. We all want that kind of stuff. We all want heaven when we die. Don't you want those kind of things? But this story unpacks why our efforts to get these things don't work. Oh, and by the way, one of the prodigals in the story is God. So there's a man who had two sons and the younger son came to him and said, give me my inheritance now. Two sons, young son, He's a deserving of about a third of his father's estate. He says, give me my inheritance now. In other words, he is saying, dad, I wish you were dead. Remarkably, the father gives this disrespectful son his share. The son takes off. And then we get scene two, which is all about the prodigal lengths that the son goes to chase pleasure and happiness. And it's all about self-discovery. It's about this immediate gratification in every direction. And he blows everything he's got in pursuit of this. And surprise, surprise, doesn't work out. Pretty soon his money is gone. He's eating pig food. Not long after this, he realizes, oops. I messed this up. The good life that I was after is not here with the pigs. It's back with dad. And so he starts to rehearse this apology. You know, oh, dad, if you would only take me back into your house, I'm not worthy to be your son. Maybe just make me one of your servants. Would you take me back like that? That's where scene three starts. So the son heads back home. As the father uh, looks out his window, it turns out the father has been looking out his window all along. He's been hoping and longing for his son to come to his senses. And, and he looks out the window today, and as soon as he sees that boy uh, come around the corner, dad tucks his cloak up, and he just starts running out towards his son. Now, can you imagine what it would be like to come to that corner in your life where you realize you've screwed everything up. You messed it all up. And so you come to the last option that you have, which is turning to God because every other bridge in your life is burnt. And you come to God and you find that he isn't angry. Instead, he actually has been waiting for you and he can't wait to get you back. For some reason that you can't imagine, the God of the universe absolutely loves you. Actually, some of us know exactly what that feels like. You see, the younger son represents the kind of people who've uh, given themselves to pursuing their own happiness through self-discovery. So, this happens when we think we know what's going to make us happy and we give ourselves to trying to get it. That's this life of self-discovery. I know what's going to make me happy. God, you don't know what's going to make me happy. 
I know what's going to make me happy, and I give myself to this. So this could be you if you value making your own way. You, you find rules repressive, so you're constantly pushing against them. You, you love to try new things. Open-mindedness is such a virtue. Tolerance is such a virtue. On the other side, you know, you know, ah, those narrow-minded bigots who think their way is the only way. That's the problem in the world. You hate those kind of people. Of course there's lots of ways to be happy. Everybody's just got to find their own path. But in the story Jesus tells, which incidentally is real life, doesn't work out. Doesn't work out for these guys. That's where the boy finds himself in this scene three. He's been out. He's taken his dad's money. He's spent it all. He's failed in life. Now he's feeding pigs. Now he's on his way home. He finds himself there. He's a disaster And yet dad is running down the road towards him. And dad is not mad. He's not even disappointed. This is is really weird. If you're a Christian and you've read this story a few times, you ever get stopped here by just, there's no disappointment in the father, even some good disappointment. There's no like, I love you, but I'm just so sad about the terrible choices you've made in life. Isn't that what a good dad would do? Like, let the kid know, like, whatever it was you're up to, man, that was dumb. Right? This dad misses that crucial opportunity. The dad in Jesus' story is so strange. You might almost call him foolish. You see, the father is recklessly forgiving towards his son. I mean, he's already given this disrespectful son everything that he could have asked for. He gave him his entire estate before he died. And now he goes and gets the best robe in the house. That's dad's robe. And his ring. And he kills the fat calf. This is in a culture where they don't eat meat every day. This dad is way over the top. He is not teaching his son to be responsible like he should. He's way too happy that this disrespectful son has come home. Actually, the word that Keller uses to describe this dad, the word he says that accurately describes him is prodigal. You see, the dictionary definition of prodigal isn't wayward or rebellious. That's what I thought it meant. The dictionary definition of prodigal means recklessly extravagant. You're prodigal when you recklessly spend everything you've got. And that's the way the father treats this son that he should have disowned. But the story's not over. There's still scene four. So when the older son, the two sons, right? This is the son who deserves two-thirds of his father's estate. When he finally gets home from the field, he's been working out there all day, being good. He is flipping mad to find out that his dad is showing his useless younger brother a party. His brother doesn't deserve this. And he is so enraged that dad would take this scoundrel back that he refuses to go into the party. He'll stand outside. He will not go in. Now, in a Middle Eastern culture, this, we got to kind of get our heads into this for a second. To, respect, uh, to reject someone's hospitality is massive. Now, to reject your father's hospitality is an absolute slap in the face, especially when your father is standing in front of all his house guests. I'm not coming into your party, Dad. You throw useless parties. This is an extreme rejection, and here we actually come across something incredibly shocking. Up until this point, everybody thought that the older son was the ideal one. But now his true heart is exposed. He's never loved his dad. He always wanted the same thing that the younger brother wanted. Dad's stuff. 
He too wishes dad was dead. He's just been using a different strategy to get to his goal. Interestingly, he's been doing the very thing that the younger son was going to ask his father for, right? He's been working as a servant in order to deserve everything his father has. But now it all comes out. Everybody would have just been horrified by his behavior. A son who rejects his father's hospitality is no son at all. He deserves to be disowned. But this kid's dad is so weird. He's prodigal weird. He's recklessly extravagant with his forgiveness. And so instead of chucking the older son out on his ear like he should, the dad in Jesus' story goes out and begs him to come in. The father wants connection with both his sons, even though both of them just want his stuff. Here's the point of Jesus' story and actually the point of Romans chapter 10. You see, Jesus is redefining sin and pointing out our role in salvation. So there's two levels to sin. At the first level of sin, everybody knows what is sinful. So uh, buying prostitutes and drinking yourself stupid is sin. Okay, that's what the younger brother does. Everybody knows that. You're throwing your life away. But for Jesus... This isn't the real problem. There's another underlying layer to sin. The real problem for Jesus is wishing your dad was dead. That's the real problem. The real problem is that you just want dead stuff. Sin for Jesus is not knowing who the father is and not giving yourself to know him more. Not knowing who the father is and not giving yourself to know him more. That's what sin is. And Jesus' story ends with this ironic cliffhanger. Turns out that the younger brother comes to shocking grips with the prodigally extravagant nature of his dad. He knows he doesn't deserve anything good, and yet he lets himself be taken into his father's embrace. The morally upright son, however, he's still outside when the story ends. And Jesus actually doesn't tell us whether the guy who's been working hard for his father ever realizes that he's been out of connection with his father all along. We don't know. Jesus doesn't say his dad never wanted his service. His dad just always wanted his love. So Jesus doesn't tell us how the story ends, but Paul does in Romans 10. You see, the older son in Jesus' story are the Jews in Paul's text. They've been trying to get to God by following his rules with extreme enthusiasm, but their zeal has been misdirected. Sincerity in belief is not enough. You can sincerely believe something wrong. And that's what the Jews believe. They, they have this incredible sincerity, but it's misdirected. The Jews thought the way to God was following his rules. They thought what God wanted was obedience to the commands. But what God actually wanted was relationship with his son. So the Jews missed who God was in spite of the fact that he had been totally, recklessly extravagant in the way that he pursued them. No other people on earth have been recklessly, extravagantly pursued like the Jews. The morally upright Jews missed God when he showed up in the flesh to die in their place. And we can miss him too. So second point, what's our role in salvation so that what happened to the Jews doesn't happen to us? Look at verse three, for they don't understand God's way of making people right, for Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believe in him 
are made right with God. Paul says Jesus has done everything righteous on our behalf, which leaves only one thing for us to do. We got to accept that God's way to life is only found in Jesus. We got to accept that God's way to life is only found in Jesus. It's not found in progressive self-discovery, a new idea, being open-minded, being tolerant. It's not found in moral obedience, doing everything right, being such a good person, coming to church, doing all the things. It's neither found in either of these things. We only get it when we believe in Jesus and accept his obedience on our behalf. But wait a minute. <laughs> like... I mean, I, I spend a lot of energy being good. I, I don't have to be good. Like, God doesn't want me to be good. He, he's not looking for me to be obedient. I, I don't have to follow his rules. I can do what I want and still get into God's house party now and forever. Really? What have I been doing all this time? Sort of. We're not done yet. Neither is Paul. Verses 5 to 13, Paul contrasts the Jewish older brother way of trying to get into God's good books with the way of faith that Jesus teaches. The way of faith. So here he says, For Moses writes that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of its commands. So the Jews had identified 613 laws in the Old Testament, which gave, uh, they gave themselves to following because they thought this is what God wants. It's like God sitting up in heaven with a, with a checklist and he's saying, you know, good, all right. Uh, Dan is obeying the Sabbath today, but he cut that hair on the side of his beards. Oh, one check, one X. We'll see how this works out in the end. And the Jews were really, really concerned about this. And the 613 laws, you got to keep track of all that kind of thing. And so they figured, well, we don't want to break those laws. We better make some more rules up just to protect those ones. So Sabbath is a rule, right? Six days you shall work, but on the seventh you shall rest. But what does that even mean? Right? I mean, how do we know when I'm actually keeping the Sabbath? I need to, I need to really know, like, is it here or is it here? Better make up some rules. Playing on the Sabbath is good, right? Obviously, you got to be able to play. Eating on the Sabbath is good. Cooking, mm, better make some rules up about that. Playing, yeah, good. What about traveling to play? Like playing at your house. Well, number one, you can't take any form of transportation, no horse, no buggy, no car. So you got to walk. But what if your house is way over there? Better make up a rule about that. And so they did. They, they said that you can't travel more, more than 963 meters from your home on the Sabbath. So 964 meters, that's the line right there. No work, work. You want to make God happy, right? Don't travel too far. If as you're hearing this, you think, my goodness, those Jews were crazy you got to know that religious people are crazy, okay? Religious people do this. We're super creative at making up our own rules for ourselves. Now, as I was thinking about which rule I should pick on here, I figured the problem with this is if we pick on rules that we have right today, then we get offended about that. So let's just pick on a rule from like 100 years ago. So that's pretty good. So uh, if you're at least as old as me, I'm not quite 100, but uh, and if you grew up in a conservative church, you will know that the Bible says we should be good stewards of our money, right? And it also says that uh, uh, those who are, have this in, in, inordinate desire to be rich, if you just really desire to be rich, that's not a good thing. And so uh, they're going to fall into temptation. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. That's First Timothy. It's a rule. And so good church folk like us took this rule and we said, well, we really, really, really want to follow that. So we need to make sure we know what that means. And so, I mean, for example, gambling would be 
not this. You're not being a good steward of your money if you're gambling. And you've probably got this inordinate desire to get rich if you gamble. So that would be bad. Can't gamble. Uh, but, you know, when you're gambling, you're using cards to do that. And so cards are bad. So let's take those off the table. No Christians are going to play cards. Uh-huh. Then it got funny because there's this funny thing. Cards are fun. Well, these Christians were sitting around worrying about this. And uh, luckily for them, um, the, uh, there was this great company called the Parker Brothers who introduced Christian cards in 1906. And they did this by scrubbing those sinful pictures of the king and the queen and the jack off of them and just replacing them with colors and numbers. Now, good Christians could play cards and make God happy. Isn't that amazing? Some of you younger people are looking at me like uh, I'm lying. <laughs> look it up, all right? Also, be careful how you look at me or you'll end up in an illustration. Okay. Here's Paul's and Jesus' point. God's not a rule keeper. He's a people keeper. God's not a rule keeper. He's a people keeper. He only gave us the rules to show us what he's like. So he's a good steward with what he has. He's not controlled by his work. He's not always striving for more. He rests and he's truthful and he's honest. He doesn't steal what's not his or covet. He gave us the law to show us who he is. He wants us to fall in love with him. He's always wanted this. He's never wanted us to try to earn his love. So Paul says, but faith's way of getting right with God says, don't say in your heart who will go up to heaven to bring Christ down. Don't say who will go down to the place of the dead to bring Christ back to life again. In other words, we can't earn our way to God by zealously following the rules to climb up to heaven, nor by digging down you know, deep inside your own willpower in order to make ourselves obey. That's not what this is about. It's not about repenting enough or repenting in the right way or, or praying the right words before bed. These are, these are rules that little legalists make up. God didn't make any of these things up. Instead, getting right with God is about realizing who God is and falling in love with him. Getting right with God happens when you realize who God is and you fall in love with him. This is where both the brothers fail. You see, neither saw any value in their father. They all just wanted his stuff, and so they both set out to get it. One of them sets out to get it by making his own path, the other by trying to follow all the rules, but neither of them are interested in their father. And yet the father goes out to both of them, and he shows them who he is. Our God is a prodigal God. He's recklessly extravagant with his grace. He just pours it out even though you don't deserve it. We've all turned away. We've all gone our own way. Some of us have done this by breaking the rules. Others of us by keeping them. But all of us have gone astray actually seeking to be our own gods. The gods of our own lives. None of us have wanted to accept King Jesus rule of our life. None of us have wanted to accept God's way of salvation. All of us have tried to get it on our own. This is what sin is for Jesus and for Paul. It's separation from the Father. So here Paul tells us what's our role in our salvation. And our role in our salvation is actually the same regardless of whether we tend to break the rules or keep them. What kind of personality do you have? Are you a rule breaker or a rule keeper? Paul says it's actually, we got the same thing because in verse 12, Paul says this, Jew and Gentile, so rule keepers and rule breakers are the same in this respect. They got the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Here it is, friends. You got to know who the Father is. And you got to call on him. 
He's not like you thought. He's recklessly generous with his grace. He's not a rule keeper. He's a people keeper. And it doesn't matter what path you've taken. He's chased you down. He's been watching at the window and hoping for your return. Or he's gone out to you when you were angry and offended. The God we serve is prodigal with his grace. He recklessly spends it to win the undeserving. So will you accept that you are undeserving? Will you accept that you are undeserving? You see, that's the requirement. That's our role in our salvation. It's to realize that we are undeserving and then to act on that. You're either undeserving because you've broken all the rules trying to make your own path, or you're undeserving because you've done everything right trying to put God in your debt. But here it is. Every undeserving sinner who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, if as you hear this, you realize that you haven't been loving God. You've just been loving his stuff. You, you want to be happy now and you want to go to heaven when you die. But you really haven't cared about the father. You, you, your passion is not living for his glory. You just want his stuff. If that's you today, then the realization is that you are one of these brothers who has slapped God in the face. And yet, God is not angry. He loves you recklessly. People would look at the way God loves you and think it's foolish. Love you? The idiot? The terrible wreck who's messed everything up? Who wants dad dead? Love you? Who is that guy? It would look foolish to people. He's been chasing you down the entire time that you've been running such that you find yourself here today. So the question is, will you repent and be saved? Whether you've been terrible or whether you've been good in church for 50 years, will you repent and be saved? Will you accept that you are undeserving and make Jesus God in your life? If you do love Jesus and you believe that his death on your undeserving behalf is what saves you, this is the second kind of person who is here today, then will you give yourself to growing in your love for him? You find out what he loves. Get to know him more. Give yourself to doing it. Will you read the Bible? This is God's word. It's, it's where God tells us about himself. Will you memorize it? Will you do what it says? Not in order to gain his acceptance, but because you already got it. Will you give yourself to this more than you give yourself to anything else? Because when you love someone, you want to grow to look like them. And the God we love is recklessly prodigal. Will you grow to look like him? We're going to go into communion today. And so you can grab those supplies if you've got them there. Communion today is for undeserving sinners. Communion today is actually only for undeserving sinners. The ironic benefit here in Jesus' story of Luke 15 
goes to this younger son and there's this strange thing. You know, Jesus often talks about the ironic benefit of the kingdom. So like, blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus says. Blessed are those who mourn. These are things that don't, we don't consider blessings. And here's another strange thing. It turns out that it's easier to come to the spot of recognizing your own undeserving need for God from the position of the prodigal son than from the morally upright son. It's hard for morally upright people to think they don't deserve anything good from from God. Not impossible. God saves morally upright people, but it's hard. Communion today is for people, for undeserving sinners. Are you an undeserving sinner today? Receiving Jesus' grace. Second person this is for is the person who, when they receive Jesus' grace, they're overcome with his incredible love for them and they want to give themselves to growing in his likeness. See, undeserving sinners who meet Jesus fall in love with him and want to do everything that pleases him. It's this funny kind of catch-22. It's easier to come to God as a prodigal, but then once you've come to God, you actually start living your life in a moral way. You want to be like God because God is moral. He's good. So when we take communion, we're saying, Jesus, I've met you. I love you. There's things in my life that don't line up with you and I'm going to cut them out of my life. I'm going to give myself to growing in your likeness. That's the response of someone who receives the grace of the Father. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, you're a huge huge God. You're way bigger than anything we could ever ask or imagine. We confess that as people, we often fall into seeking, not you, but seeking your blessings, the good stuff you've got. Happiness, abundance, joy, love, all great things and, of course, eternal life when we die. But, Father, you want us to seek you. You wanted this so bad that you did something crazy. You entered your creation. You took on our skin lived the life we could not live 
and died the death we all deserve. You did all of this to win us to yourself so that we could fall in love with you and our hearts could actually be changed from stone to flesh. That we would actually want to live our lives in a way that brings you glory. That we would actually want you. So come Holy Spirit now and do this work in us. I pray for those who maybe find themselves right now realizing they've never actually been a Jesus follower, even though they've been in church for 50 years. They've always just been here for your stuff and never for you. I pray for those, Lord. I pray for, for a spirit of repentance there, an awakening to who you are. And I pray for those who do love you, but find themselves still being tripped up in things that distract us, things that don't image you. And I pray for a determination and a strength by your Holy Spirit that we would stand up under temptation and live for your glory. Pray all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.